dedicated to the topic, what is the role of history in contemporary political discourses? When I got the topic, where uh, I thought that it's a hot topic or even a hot potato topic. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, generally speaking, we have a group of experts of different backgrounds, which makes this discussion even more interesting. So people from history, uh, philosophy, educational studies, as well as political science. Uh, and we are going to give you just a short introductory speeches, around five minutes long, and then we'll try to make it the rest of the the time as interactive as possible. Let me start with a very short uh, introduction from a slightly different angle uh, comparing to what we have heard so far. Recent cognitive research on episodic memory and future thinking uh, has demonstrated that memories from the past are not only central to the self-identity formation process, but also central to the thinking about the future events. Uh, for example, in many forms of amnesia, the people are not able to think, imagine the future. So, to put it simply, not remembering the past uh, make us uh, make it much more problematic or even impossible to imagine the future. This is something that has been proved on the individual level. So far, there has been not much evidence from scholarship when we think about how it works on a collective level. But uh, definitively, in the process of group collective identity formation, political Milieus, politicians themselves, and the people who create the political discourses can be seen as a kind of depositories of the past and of the truth. This is important and interesting, at least from my perspective, from three points of view, from three reasons. First of all, that we live in a time of the post-politics. I will give you just an example. The person who has won the third place in the presidential election run last month in Poland uh, announced officially that he has no political program, but what he has is a political strategy. So no past, no ideologies, but definitely just a political strategy. Second thing is that the collective uh, identity formation made by politicians or within the political discourses. It's also important when you look at it from an angle what has been used, what has been the topic, what has been the content, but even more important, and this is something I want to turn your attention and you will hear some interesting points from our speakers. Uh, it's what has not been said, which what has not been used in these political discourses. Another, just short, and the last example from the Polish perspective. Uh, so how a few very important historical events has not been exploited um, in balance by political milieus and what was the effect. The March of Independence, probably you heard the stories, the news from Poland. Generally speaking, this is an, of course an important uh, memorial, important day, but by part of the political uh, circles in Poland, it was somehow abandoned. Definitively, it has not been discussed through. Uh, in balance within the society in the last 25, 25 years. At the result, we have a pretty ridiculous in the symbolic uh, platform uh, march organized by the president, whose, which symbol was a eagle made out of chocolate. And on the contrary, a huge march that was a constitutive event for the radical right nationalist movements, which are stronger and stronger, as you probably see. It is not only important to look through what about what has been said, what has been used from the past, but also maybe what has been abandoned or forgotten, and what are the results. Uh, and now the floor will be given to our speakers. We'll start with, uh, I suppose, very interesting uh, contribution from Peter Buch from Artus University, Copenhagen University. Uh, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. I got it relatively late, so my thoughts will be a little bit scattered. Uh, uh, what I what came to my mind when reading the program, sitting in a train from Aarhus to Copenhagen, a flight from Copenhagen to Prague, and a train again from Prague to Brno. Fortunately, most of these were delayed, so I had extra time to think. Uh, let me start with uh, a clarification. This panel is called The Role of History in Contemporary Political Discourse, and I would like to distinguish here between the past and history. You spoke about the past and the importance of the past for personal memory and identity formation, but I would like to make a distinction between the past, which is everything that has happened and is no more. I mean, ontologically, the past does not exist. And that's the starting point for us here. Uh, we're not talking, I hope, here about the role of the past in contemporary political discourse, then would have to talk about path dependency with political science or other such phenomena. What I'm into will be the role of history understood first as a set of conventions for how to construct or reconstruct, there's always an element of construct, not just reconstruct here, uh, some certain elements of that non-existing past. It's the set of conventions and it's the stories that come out of following these conventions. A couple of years ago, uh, Maria Tororova, the Bulgarian-American uh, historian, at a conference declared that if an historian is looking for evidence in support of a hypothesis, he's bound to succeed. Inevitably, since the past is an indefinite rep repository of of building blocks, we can always construct an argument and find things that support. If this holds true for historians, what about politicians? Inevitably, they have an even freer hand because for a politician, the use and reference of history is first of all a device to gain political legitimacy. If historical references have some element of veracity, it's an asset, but that's not the purpose of it. The purpose inevitably is one of gaining credibility for the aims, ambitions, and so on that these politicians have. And we shouldn't blame the politicians for doing this. It's part of the game, no matter whether we're talking Denmark, the USA, or Central Europe. So where, in that sense, of course, Benedetto Croce is right when he says that all history is contemporary history. It goes for us historians and it goes even more for the politicians. So where does that leave us historians when confronted with political use of history? First of all, we can address and should address blatant factual errors, distortions, and so on and so forth. But in many ways, I find it even more important that we analyze uh, the discursive and epistemological foundations of these political historical discourses. We should have a critical distance to concepts such as the nation, totalitarianism, suffering, menace, purity, our heroes, etc., etc., etc. Our task, and here I'm blatantly normative, is to make uh, the instrumentality of what goes on visible. That is, our job is to be in the service not of truth or something big, but in the service of a certain critique of power. And my third point, what we should do uh, here, I would say that methodological nationalism is an enemy of, of serious historiography. So that's perhaps one starting point. The third thing we should do is to show some humility towards or respect for lived experience. Uh, I have one last anecdote and then I'm done. Uh, an anthropologist, a Danish anthropologist, worked some 10 years ago uh, in a small Polish village rather close to the border to Belarus. And when he interviewed the older people of the village and asked them what's sort of the, the most important event in the life of the village, pretty much all his respondents of that older generation said 1963. 1963, well, not 
1980, Solidarity, 1981, uh, Martial Law, 1989, no, 1963. Why? Because that was the year the village got a tractor. The tractor radically altered social and economic structures, working relations, and so on in the village. The answer is perfectly logical and legitimate. If we just respond with a laugh, we end up marginalizing the province, the weak, the uneducated, women, minorities, and so on and so forth. When we historians operate in the service of transitional justice, declaring 1989 to be a caesura, the victory of democracy, and so on and so forth, we forget that from a social historical perspective, this needs not be the case. We become blind to the injustices of transition, and in so doing, we leave the floor open for all kinds of populists, claiming that there was no revolution of 89, there was no victory of democracy, and so on and so forth. So a little bit of humility and an awareness that history is more than political history, despite politicians constantly making claim to it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very short and very inspiring. Uh, let's go to the second uh, presentation by Anna Raluca Bigu from University of Bucharest, political philosopher, educational studies specialist. The floor is yours. A small floor, yes. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will address today a very specific case regarding post-communist Romania. Actually, my uh, our colleague, Hungarian colleague Gabor, is familiar with the topic because I addressed it in another conference. Uh, well, what I want to present today is a very different perspective of how the history is used in Romania in the post-communist discourse of the Orthodox Church. The main church in Romania, which accounts for almost 90% of the believers. So more specifically, I look at the way in which certain historical figures are depicted in the post-communist orthodox religion education textbooks. And given the fact that the overwhelming majority of the Romanians are declaring themselves orthodox, um, religion education in Romania usually means orthodox teachings offered in a confessional manner, manner during primary or secondary school, that means 13 years of religious education in Romania, with no alternative subjects offered, so we don't have ethics as an alternative. Um, the fall of the communists reinstalled religious education into the school curricula, but the secular tendencies that affect, affected Western Europe shaped also the way in which religion was taught in Central and Eastern Europe. Still, ch challenging this trend of West mirror secularization is some, in some Orthodox dominant countries like Romania, teaching religion in public schools remains com remained confined to a nationalistic discourse both at the level of curricula and textbooks. This is also available, uh, this is also uh, um, uh, available for also for history textbooks in Romania, that sees religion as a key element of building national identity through centuries. Um, this claim I made is documented by a systematic comparative account that I made in the last two years of a number of 13 orthodox uh, religious education textbooks and auxiliary ma materials used in Romanian public schools. Uh, I have to say that 90% of the students in Romania are enrolled in uh, public education. It's very important. But also I made a uh, uh, systematic uh, analysis of several history books in Romania especially from the high school level, bringing into focus for the moment only uh, context-based analysis. So this is uh, very much a research in progress, and I will use uh, qualitative analysis for uh, later stages. So the deep interview, what, what, I, what I found, what was the, my results were that um, I saw that um, the using uh, the nationalist discourse, the orthodox religious textbooks gradually shape throughout the, uh, throughout the curricula a, concept, a complex concept of Romanianness, comprising both elements of national and religious identity, but also a comprehensive framework for excluding other denominations present in Romania. We have 18 recognized denominations in Romania, but the Orthodox is the main one. 
Well, uh, what I found that is throughout the textbook, the authors construct a legitimizing discourse for the Orthodox Church by constantly relating, relating it to the history of the Romanian people from its early beginnings in order to prove that Orthodoxy is the sole genuine face and that the Orthodox Church deserves the status of a national church. Um, another important find, found, uh, find was that the textbooks use a simplistic two dimension, and what, this is what I want to talk today. So the textbooks use a sim simplistic two dimension characterization of several historical and cultural personalities presented in the textbook to serve as models. So we have this uh, uh, characterization in the case of several fi figures into Romanian history, seen both as, um, all right, um, seen both as a political rulers and as saints. So we have historical figures that are presented only as national heroes and saints. Um, well, this usual characterization in the textbook insists along two main features. One is the love for their country, and the second is their strong faith. While ignoring, of course, other relevant features that could help see these figures, historical figures, in a more realistic light. And um, uh, one of the notorious cases, one of the uh, medieval rulers, Stephen the Great, that was made saint by the post-communist Romanian Orthodox Church, who is presented in all the textbooks only as a saint that dedicated his life to stop the Turkish and Tatar invasion, or, but ignoring his t very complicated personal life, he has like four wives, which otherwise is the same textbook would condemn. So this, this, uh, this morality of this ruler is completely ignored by the religious education textbooks. Um, so in the textbook we have political rulers that are exemplary Christians and we have orthodox clerics also presented in, in the textbooks who are exemplary patriots. So we have this dual characterization. Still, when it comes to sacrifice, an exceptional ruler which is also, who is also Christian, is described as sacrificing himself as a hero of the nation, this is a vocabulary, was in, while in the case of a religious figure, who of course is also a patriot, his sacrifices makes him a martyr of the faith. So we have hero of the nations and martyrs of the faith. Still, uh, in the uh, 12th grade, or at the end of the high school textbooks, um, they make a one step further in the direction of a nationalistic stance. By combining the vocabulary used to describe these categories, by mixing them together, while speaking of a new category, this is of martyrs of the nation. So martyrs of kinship, not a nation, it's, it's a special term. Um, so that we have, till now we have heroes of the nation and martyrs of the faith. Now we have this new category of martyrs of the nation. And thereby suggesting that we as Romanians have a moral duty to respect and honor the figures. We might ask now, what are the specific gains that the church might have but employing this nationalistic discourse in the religious education textbooks in Romania? What are the gains? Does this discourse influence the political milieu? Does it bring new subjects and ideas in the public sphere or influence the political agenda? The answer is yes in both cases. First, the Orthodox Church is the main beneficiary of the governmental funds uh, that are accorded by the government all denominations. So each time the elections are organized in Romania, the church acts like an electoral agent that every politician or party in power will court in order to get the votes. Secondly, as concerning, as concerning that, uh, that uh, vocabulary, speaking of martyrs of the nation, the church has conceded, this is very new, the church has succeeded in convincing the government to establish a whole year of celebration at the national level dedicated to a 17th century, 18th century ruler, Constantin Bunkovanu, who died in the Ottoman hands together with his sons. So the political milieu in Romania was very eager to accept the idea. So the last year, 2014, was declared the years of the Saint Martyrs. Brunkovano and his sons, by a governmental decree. And despite the huge amount of public money to organize the commemoration, uh, there were numerous events organized into Romania in the, in, on the broad. So in this way, the church succeeded in influencing the political agenda in Romania 
uh, last year and receive additional funds as an organizer and promoter of the event. That was all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. And now it's time for the, the interesting presentation by Agnes Tamash from University of Seged. In my postdoctoral project, I analyze um, caricatures uh, from comic papers. And uh, in this paper, uh, I analyze symbols of the most important uh, events, the loss and gain of territories, and um, uh, the signing of the peace treaties in comic papers. Um, most of the comic papers illustrated uh, the unfairness of the peace treaties in the period already before the signing of the treaties, highlighting the motive of force instead of negotiations. In issues following the signing, the caricaturist evaluated the treaties and uh, depicted the expected consequences of a new war in Europe in the near future. Oh. Sorry. And now about the symbols of loss and gain of territories. The motive of, uh, of maps was especially suitable as a symbol of loss or gain of territories. From the many examples found in the magazines, you can see only a few. Um, the next recurring element in the caricatures is the motive of eating of territories. For example, in one caricature, the pita eaters, Serbs, uh, Romanians, and Czechoslovaks are eating a cake of the shape of the former Hungarian uh, kingdom. Gluttony is one of the seven deadly sins, therefore this motive was also appropriate to judge the gain of territories. The next, sim the next symbol, the mutilation of a female body symbolizing the country or of a male body symbolizing the nation has long traditions as symbol for loss of territories. One can observe the total amputation of Hungary in one caricature. However, the motive of amputation didn't appear only in connection with Hungary. The amputations are linked closely with the depiction of doctor-patient situations because the doctors, the winners, operate on the defeated countries represented as patients. To illustrate the loss of territories, this way was also a common allegory in connection um, in our caricatures after war defeat. Lastly, uh, one of the common motifs of the Hungarian and Austrian comic papers was the depiction of uh, pain uh, in a similar way as the suffering of Christ uh, as well. In the Hungarian comic papers, the bitterness appeared first at Christmas 1919, when Michael the Hungarian couldn't decorate his Christmas tree because it's um, branches, uh, Transylvania, Upper Hungary, Western Hungary, and uh, parts of South uh, Hungary were torn off, but on the last branch burned a candle with the caption Hope, and it lit up the whole room. At the end of the year 1921, only suffering was de depicted. Uh, the motive of the suffering of Christ which was used in comic uh, papers outside of Hungary as well, uh, where, for instance, uh, Austria can be uh, seen crucified as well. In the Austrian comic papers, the sadness over the forbidden Anschluss was often depicted too. For example, George Clemenceau, depicted as a doctor, is cutting the German twins apart with a saw, but uh, the twins have two heads and uh, one body, therefore the operation is likely to be deadly for both of them. It's not possible to know for sure if the depiction of Clemenceau as a doctor was connected or not with his original profession as a physician. And the last sentence is, in the caricatures demonstrated uh, elements, for example, suffering, uh, death, the enmity, became a part of the Austrian and Hungarian national identity between 
the two world wars. The comic papers took an active part in this, in the popularization of this propaganda from the beginning, despite the fact that their primary function is entertainment. The Hungarian and Austrian comic papers depicted the new neighbors with sarcastic mockery, and in the Austrian um, comic papers, anti-Hungarianism uh, can be observed as well. Hungary propagated the idea of territorial integrity. The negative depictions of the former national groups of the monarchy lived on, also in caricatures, and the way of depiction was very similar. Thank you for your attention. For the great timing and some illustration to this alternative channels of the political discourses on national identities. And we are jumping to our last presentation by Łukasz Jasina, Polish Museum, History Museum and Cultura Liberalna Weekly. The floor is yours. To be little touch with Peter's speech, I'm a historian and I and a contrary to you, I think that past exists. And uh, I, that's a feeling very popular among Poles in the last 20 years. Uh, we are the nation, the community where discussions on history, uh, history connected with the present situation of the country and community are still very popular and they are still uh, create many emotions. Uh, at the beginning of the 90s, Dealing of the history became very important thing to build independent country. And there was a moment when Poles were proud uh, because of the way we deal with the history uh, when we create reconciliation with the Germans and we try to reconciliate with other neighbors like with Ukrainians. Of course, there were uh, there were neighbors which whom we didn't try to reconciliate, uh, and that's the example of Czechs, Slovaks, and some way at the beginning Belarusians because there were no partners there to talk about the history. But uh, even there, later, ten years after the independence of our country, situation changed for a little while, and the history became important again. Uh, since 2004, new politics of memory created by both a right and justice party and later by the civic platform, the political parties which were born within the last 10 years, which was some way supported by other parties from the left and right side of the political stage. It was, let's say, the opinion of the majority of the, of the country, again made history very important and again made, let's say, uh, the national, not nationalistic version of the history, this version which was the official one. Of course, there was nothing like that in Poland, like official uh, picture of the motherland in the textbooks. There was no uh, lack of discussion within the researchers and academicians. Uh, there was even no special law against uh, someone who lies about the Polish history, which could be happened in few countries in the world. But there was official policy. Uh, and the example of this policy is, of course, uh, the process of making big historical museums, which are now very important uh, answer for that. The first of these museums was, of course, Museum of Poly of Warsaw Rising, opened 11 years ago. This museum wasn't a result of official state policy. It was, let's say, the result of the uh, community movement. It was created by the circle of intellectuals. And it was, of course, a museum dedicated only to one of the battle, but battle very important to define present Polish history because uh, the destruction of Warsaw is still one of the most important points in the Polish historical debate. And this museum resulted with building the next museums. Uh, so far, only one of them is opened. Uh, this is the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, which was probably because, which was probably the most important of them. Uh, we need to remember that one of the most important factors of the Polish reconciliation policy was internalization of the Polish Jewish history, which happened. 
and the other museums like big Polish history museum which waits for the opening and construction museum of western lands of Poland which could be properly located in Wrocław and the museum of the second world war where Polish official version of the second world history will be presented at last waiting for the construction as probably will be open next few years and uh, uh, changing of the Polish political stage uh, which is happening now probably would help in it. The other problem uh, is of course uh, the problems with finishing with reconciliation. Uh, that's not only a question of Germans and Poles. Uh, the last happenings in Ukraine show to the Poles that our debates on the cruel history, which included our two nations, needs to be solved. And there is a little problem with the Polish circles which can do this. And of course there is a little problem with the new Ukrainian state, which I don't think it's ready to discuss about the dark moments of the movements which are the base of the new Ukrainian politics of memory. Thank you. These were very brief introductions to the very complex topics and areas of research. I hope to have uh, comments and more queries from the audience. But before we we'll give you the floor, uh, do you have any comments or questions to each other? Uh, I ask our panelists anything that you would find interesting to, to go in, into. Not at this point. Let me just um, touch upon one thing I find particularly interesting. The common all these short questions were um, a kind of alternative channels and alternative actors that influence the sphere of politics and that can be these days in the era of post-politics or, or post-party politics maybe even more effective in a process of collective identity building. I would find interesting your reflections upon this, whether you see any effective alternative ways or actors that shape the political discourse on identities. To be again very short and come very quick to conclusion, uh, I think we started from caricatures which were made 100 years ago and I think one of the most important actors now is the cinema and historical movies which could be a very important instrument of, of popularization of history and also about the politics of memory. And uh, to be back in Poland again, uh, all the most popular movies uh, made in Polish cinema last few years are based on history. It shows that history still matters and still is very important uh, inspiration for the artists and of course a very important inspiration for the viewers who are interested in the topics which are included in the historical movies. Does it always need to be a kind of close relationship between the, the historians and politicians in order to, to, to shape or to reshape the collective identity? Well, the, the question is, of course, uh, how much of what goes on in that closed circuit of, of uh, historicizing uh, politicians and politicizing historians that actually makes a genuine impact. Uh, sometimes I feel uh, I, I am a, a member of the uh, scientific council, the Vjedatska Rada of the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes in Prague, uh, an organization which was founded for political reasons, obviously, and has struggled with its academic and scientific identity vis-a-vis -vis pretty strong political pressures for its instrumentalization pressures uh, expressed also in the law founding the institution, for example, the use of the word totalitarian 
or the definition of the Second World War of a period of unfreedom that is somewhat less than the totalitarian era which was set to last from February 48 to December 89, for example, the hierarchy expressed in the legislation there. Uh, but sometimes I have a feeling that much of what goes on in that closed circuit has very little resonance in the broader public. And that I fully agree with you, uh, memories uh, of, uh, or memories is not the right word, uh, understandings or images of how it was in the communist era, for example, or earlier period, Second World War, are shaped much more by TV. We see the same, it doesn't have to be in, in post-communist or post-post-communist states. It's the same in Denmark. Uh, we know today, historically, for example, that we had more Danes uh, volunteering to fight with the Waffen-SS or in the German army, regular army, against communism that we had Danes active in the resistance movement until two or three days before liberation. But when Danish if, historical movies are different. But Danish historical movements still, movies still glorify resistance and uh, when we ask people, even young people, which image do they uh, believe in, they, they go for, for the heroic one. I mean, the impact of, of serious scholarship is minimal, which of course gives politicians a pretty free hand to play along with the popular stereotypes. So yes, the challenges, and here I'm back at, at, at my starting point, uh, if we do not sufficiently uh, respect uh, personal uh, memories or, or stories traded from, from generations and so on and so forth and stick only with these official uh, paradigms, the impact of what we do will be minimal. Actually, actually this is something what exactly is going on and what fueled the electoral support for the anti-establishment movements in the recent Polish elections and the elections to take place in October. Basically, this is about the disillusionment of uh, so-called success of the transition in Poland. So that it not has been discussed in the uh, necessarily detail to and left much space for this um, unclear accusations and quasi facts taken out of nowhere, but still that has not been challenged or faced with a serious and comprehensive debate from each side of political stage. I really liked the approach uh, Anna Raluca uh, presented or, or has taken because it, it turned the attention to the fact that in the Central and Eastern Europe, as probably most of us are, are aware, uh, not only the typical political actors are uh, playing the first fiddle in when shaping collective identities is in question. Uh, do you think that um, uh, or could you please tell us something more shortly about the relations between the Orthodox Church and the politicians or political uh, elites in, in Romania? Yeah, uh, I would like to, but first I want to step in a little bit in the discussion about cinema because it's an interesting perception that the Romanian have towards, uh, I mean, we have a strong cinema movement uh, in Romania in post-communism um, and uh, they try to uh, to uh, to make, uh, to make uh, movies about uh, the life of the common people during communism, a lot of movie about that, but um, also a lot of people in Romania Romania, they don't really appreciate that kind of move, movies because they are still prisoners of this official way of seeing history as a succession of heroical figures. So there, are, so uh, the several movies that were successful were uh, movies a lot about uh, you know heroical figures from the ancient. Uh, history, not so much the movies about uh, what the remain, what uh, about the recent history and what what happened during the communists, because uh, uh, many people they still have bitter memories about this time, so they are not very enchanted to see that on TV. 
so it, I think it's important to stress that uh, it's very important to the, uh, the perception of history and how we should understand history uh, is uh, very much uh, is very much important when we are doing these movies. So even we have very successful abroad. These these movies were about the communist times uh, were very successful abroad, but not in Romania. So it's interesting. I guess. Um, in what concerns the relation of the Orthodox Church with the political milieu, uh, well, as I said, that uh, I mean, as long as the church will be an electoral agent during elections, as long as the politician will uh, uh, make gifts toward the church in order to get elected, because the local priest, especially at the rural levels, uh, level, will uh, tell people at the sermons who should they vote. Um, there will be a deep entanglement between the political uh, and the religious spheres in Romania. And I think it's a vicious circle and I have, for the moment, I have no solution on how it could be break. Um, do we have any questions or comments from you? Maybe some of you would like to take a part in the discussion, although we had this advantage of being the first panel after the lunch, as was mentioned by Dr. Vasechka, this is not the, the best position. <laughs> uh, I was wondering about uh, using the humor or caricatures in the um, political struggle. Uh, the examples you gave us, Agnes, was an example of kind of reaction to something that by many was perceived as unstoppable, not only unfair, but also unstoppable um, uh, situation. Uh, could you maybe comment on the contemporary situation in Hungary and do you find uh, maybe new forms or the, the, of using this kind of tools in the contemporary political discourse? Oh, maybe it's too, too, too detailed. <laughs> yes, um, I think um, um, as um, Tamás Stark and uh, Miklós Taylor uh, also spoke about uh, Trianon and the uh, trauma of Trianon and um, so on, so uh, it's uh, something uh, which lives in our political uh, thinking. and. Um, and we have now also political caricatures about, not about Trianon, but uh, about the um, contemporary political situation. Targeted towards? Um, uh, it depends on the caricatures on the magazine and so on. So I saw also um, left and right uh, winged caricatures. And we have caricatures, um, for example, from Germany about uh, our prime minister. Thank you. Um, we have heard a few uh, different standpoints and uh, different examples of uh, the same problem, which is actually could be put under this, the one question whether it's more that history or so-called past that does not exist, uh, influence political discourse and politics, or it goes all the way around. Of course, it's uh, hard to answer, or the answer to both questions is yes. Um, I was wondering about uh, your, I mean, audience, our distinguished guests, uh, reflections upon uh, the a digital era and uh, maybe novelties within the political discourses that has been brought up by the internet and so-called e-citizens. Do you see anything interesting going on in your countries, in your regions in that term? Maybe some of you have any reflections on that? Where the political discourse was changed or somehow shaped by the E participation. Uh, we talk about this discourse in a with the history a little. Let's say it's changed in Poland. It's changed a lot um, because uh, now um, history is one of the things we usually think we know a lot. 
It's like a medicine, it's like a legal system, it's like a church, it's like a sport. Uh, but uh, there was not so easy before the digital era to show how much we know, because there were only official channels uh, of expression. Uh, official publications, official newspapers, historical newspapers, academic circle. Uh, now, everyone can talk what he wants thanks to, to, to the plurality of, uh, of sources, of possibilities. And uh, let's look at Facebook and other social, uh, social medias. There is a lot of groups, profiles dedicated to the history, where history, and especially, this is visible in East Central Europe, when, for example, after the Ukrainian Revolution, the number of the uh, groups and profiles dedicated to the Polish-Ukrainian history, to the uh, you, you genocide made by the Ukrainians and genocide made by Poles, uh, is growing up all the time and it's completely without something what is important for the professional historians, without any, any piece of professionalism and without any piece of using of, of the things well done. Because Polish-Ukrainian relations are very important for this because, let's say, something was done by the historian. Polish and Ukrainian historians made a lot. There is a very good debate, a lot of books. And when we look at this popular debate on history, this debate is made like nothing was done before. What it means, this digitalization, digitalization of the discussion is, of course, very great because everyone could be interested. But there is no connection between uh, the academician world, which is very important, and the world of the popular people. And it could be important for us to to pass this, these problems, because uh, we cannot throw away the results of the researchers. I want to say something in reply to what you said. Uh, in Romania, there, uh, I mean, the history teacher can choose between a plurality of history textbooks, but and this is in principle a very good idea, because it at the decision of the schools to choose one history textbook, but the problem is who is doing, who, is, who are the authors of the history textbooks? And uh, the, uh, an analysis of the history textbooks will see, uh, analyzing them will see that they are the same authors, you know, and the same, a same common worldview. And I want to say about, uh, about the spreading of popular understanding of history through Facebook that in Romania it was an interesting development in the re recent years. We had a lot of Facebook groups and on the internet a lot of groups, uh, protochronist groups. So it's there are a lot in recent times. And of course they spread a, a very false view of history of, 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 uh, and also of a Romanian exceptionalism. And uh, I think it's interesting. I don't, I don't know if in other countries it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, there is a resurgence of protochronists in post-communist times. A colleague of mine, a Danish historian, Uffe Östergaard, uh, declared uh, somewhat provocatively a few years ago that uh, the Danish nation not just as that uh, famous imagined community, but as a community of people with shared references, uh, frames of mind, visions, and so on and so forth, came into being only in the 1960s with the mass spread of monopoly television. Since in the 1960s, pretty much every Danish family would switch on to the same Yes. yes. So uh, you can say that uh, Danes, as a collective with a shared frame of reference, was produced not merely by the military and popular education, although that did a lot, but first of all by television in his somewhat exaggerated but not completely irrelevant statement. That would then suggest that with the uh, internet and the proliferation of, of new media, some of that uh, coherence has gone lost. Uh, 
it's a loss of the monopoly status of, of uh, journalists, of experts like historians and, and political scientists and so on and so forth, for better or worse, but it's also a loss of coherence and shared frames of reference. So this plurality is, is simply a fact. We probably don't know the consequences in depth yet. It's a fact for good and for bad that we have to take into account. Subgroups will, will have their own visions of the world and they will only be in dialogue with like-minded people, which will mean that, that uh, the challenge that comes from being confronted with someone who looks at the world differently is minimized, and that can be pretty dangerous. We had a most arch Norwegian case of that uh, at Utøya a couple of years ago, not Muslim terrorists, couldn't be more blonde Norwegian in the area in that regard, a person living a parallel life on the internet, mm -hmm. developing a very parallel understanding of what Norwegian history and identity was all about. Just to uh, sum it up, as our time is almost over, yes, uh, I would add to it that uh, at least in Central and Eastern Europe, it seems that the official uh, political discourses uh, are not uh, very well embedded inside the cyberspace, in a sense that, of course, it's a space for alternative opposition uh, plethora of views, but on the other hand, uh, as an interactive and uh, for many youngsters, only source of information about what is political and to some extent what is collective in the uh, statehood sense, uh, definitively what we are missing is the uh, is a very coherent and unofficial uh, message or if you want propaganda uh, to, 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 be, uh, to be handled. Thanks. Uh, can I have a short comment, a short question? Um, uh, first of all, I, uh, I would like to stress that I do not believe in post-political age. I believe there is a new generation which despises politics. And this is not producing a society of uh, the individuals who are privately successful. This, is, this can very well produce uh, a, a morbid deviations of politics maybe some extremist or, uh, sorry for the word, Mr. Boogie, uh, totalitarian movements, some new sorts of. Uh, but a short question which, which is connected with it, and it's for any of you, uh, the panelists. Uh, I have sensed in my country, which is Slovakia, uh, uh, and we were talking about it yesterday, even considering other countries, some official policies which are despising or are hostile towards the humanities as such. As something from the utilitarian point of view which does not pay, which is useless, which cannot be applied. We need engineers. We do not need any philosophers or historians and such like. Can you say if you, can you say if you, especially from Western Europe, have some, some similar experience recently or any time, or or maybe how do you see, uh, again, the task or the, the use of humanities considering our problem discussed? Thank you. Well, yeah, what I can see in and Western Europe with regard to the humanities is a very strong uh, utilitarianism. Uh, the humanities increasingly have to legitimize their existence uh, through producing candidates that can get jobs in the private sector. That's sort of the purpose. Uh, by and large, uh, the humanities are tolerated, financing is not disappearing, but uh, the discourse of legitimacy is no longer one of Bildung uh, per se. 
it is one of you need specific skills from the humanities first of all cultural analysis uh, sign analysis media analysis and so on because we need people with these competences in the private sector so this utilitarianism is there and of course it affects the ways in which we conduct research uh, funding is increasingly defined by where students go and where students go is increasingly defined by by uh, employment rates so yes so so it's happening uh, probably from a somewhat better starting position and with more funding and and universities are uh, resilient conservative institutions for good also so uh, there is a lot of what you could call civic disobedience or standesbewusstsein among among the scholars but the pressures are definitely there and if you look at it from a 10 or 15 year perspective you can see quite a drastic change in the functioning of the humanities and in which disciplines have the most professors and where you have disciplines being more or less demolished unfortunately we give you a chance for a short break before we start the second working uh, we need to stop now. Thank you for your attendance and hopefully we'll continue the discussion after hours. Thank you very much. Thank you for you being here and uh, see you after 15 minutes break.